we need you, we need you. Oh, we need you tonight, God. Oh, come on, tell them that you need him.
Hallelujah. Father, we're so thankful that there have been given unto us great and exceeding precious promises. God, you've given multiple numbers of promises and they are super abundant. God, you never give us less than we need. You always give us more than we deserve. And Lord, I thank you for the promises of God that are in Christ Jesus, yea and amen, yes and so be it. When you make a promise, you keep your word. Father, you don't promise and not perform. For you're not a man that you should lie, nor the son of man that you should repent. If you said it, you'll do it. If you spoke it, you'll bring it to pass. Lord, I thank you for the promises you've given to Central Assembly of God. You promised to bring revival to this city, to this church. And Lord, we're standing on that word. We're believing for revival to come to us so it can come through us. And God, we don't back down. We don't step aside from that. We stand firm on the word of God. For your word always comes to fruition. God, tonight I pray, Lord, that you would just manifest your power in this place. God, we lift up those who need a touch in their body. We, we lift up Mrs. Jewel tonight. God, who needs strength in her body and in the inner man. She just needs God to come down and infuse her with power from on high. Lord, we curse COVID in her body. And Lord, we pray for complete healing. Lord, for Dwayne's mom. Lord, she's again doing well. But Lord, I pray God for continued touch upon her. And God, we do lift up Lord Haley, Lord Father, who has just had an operation today and recovering, very painful. Lord, messed her knee up, but God, you're the healer. Lord, for John, Lord, is Father, he's had some tests taken today and I pray God had come back positive and a good report. Lord, I pray God that you would just intervene and intercede on his behalf. I thank you that you're making intercession for us. You're praying for us as we pray for one another. And Lord, tonight I thank you that, Lord, your prayers are always heard and they're always answered. God, you said, call unto me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And Lord, that's our assurance tonight that when we call on your name, you answer our cry. And Lord, tonight's no exception. And I pray, Lord, that as we enter into the word, I pray, God, that you would, Father, let it come alive. Father, it may be something we've read and studied in the past, but God, it's still fresh because it comes from you. And I pray tonight, Lord, that it would, Lord, be an engrafted word. It would be a rhema word, a revealed word, a word in due season for somebody that needs to hear it. God, we ask this in the name of Jesus and for your glory alone. And everybody said, amen. amen. Before you sit down, shoot somebody a virtual high five, a big old hug in the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Couple of announcements. Men, calling all men. Are there any men in the house? Men, tomorrow night at 6.30, men's Bible study, right in the fellowship hall. Amen. And uh, seven, changed. No, it's been seven. Royal Riders is 6.30. I go every week and get mixed up in what meeting I'm in. Seven o'clock, men... Be there for Bible study tomorrow night. Then on Sunday, Sunday night, the Couples Connection is having their Zoom Bible study at 6 o'clock. And uh, join in with that. Couples, all couples are invited to be a participant in our Zoom Bible study. Again, that's this Sunday at 6 p.m. Women for Christ are having a 1980s party on June the 25th at 6 o'clock here at the church. Come dressed up like a 1980s person. It's going to be a fun night, ladies, so mark that down on your calendar. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Appreciate your ministry. Amen. Turn with me in the Bible tonight to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
And we know this chapter is what? The love chapter. Paul addressed spiritual gifts in chapter 12. He's going to come back and hit them again in chapter 14. But between chapters 12 and 14, he nestles in this word from on high. He said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Father, tonight... Breathe upon your word and let it bring life into our lives. God, anoint this vessel of clay with power from on high, with clarity of speech and clarity of thought and exactness of truth. I pray, God, that we would not taint your word with our opinion, but, God, I pray, Lord, we would declare your word in all honesty and truthfulness and Lord, may we keep in context the text we are studying. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Following his list of spiritual gifts in chapter 12, Paul changes his tone and he turns his attention to the motivation behind the gifts. How many know that spiritual gifts are never to be motivated out of a prideful attitude? It's never about the person that's being used in a gift. It's about the one that the gift is being used for. Amen. When God gives gifts, it's for the body. It's not for just one individual in particular. And he said here, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. On the day of Pentecost, when tongues of fire sat upon each of those that were gathered in the upper room, they began to speak in an unknown language, unknown to them. But on that day, the languages that were spoken were known by those around them. They were simply earthly languages that they had never learned themselves, but God allowed them to speak with tongues of men. And... Some people believe that tongues is only a language that can be understood somewhere on the earth. But it is clear in this passage, in this verse, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. God not only gives you a language that can be known on earth. When my wife got baptized in the Holy Ghost, I'm telling on her tonight, she was sharing this just recently with somebody, but... When she got baptized in the Holy Ghost, she was wondering what she might be saying. And her sister worked in a, in a IRS office where there were different languages that were being spoken. And so Jennifer said to her sister, she said, 
Hey, ask some of those people around you that speak in other languages, the interpreters, you, you ask them if they might know what I might be saying if I'm speaking in a language they understand or not. And she phonetically spoke the words to her sister that God had given her. And when her sister shared it, one of the interpreters, I believe an Indian person, person from India said you, that you are saying, I worship you, O Most High. Amen, I worship you, O Most High. And it could be translated. And I've heard of messages in tongues and interpretation that were given. And the tongues that came forth didn't even need interpretation because it was a language that somebody in the audience understood. They weren't even saved. And God spoke through the gift of tongues. And it was the message that was being delivered. And this person understood it. So there are times when God gives you tongues that it is a, learn, a, a language that is known on earth. But there are other times when God gives you a language that nobody on earth can in, interpret. And in the flesh, it would take the Spirit of God because it is a heavenly language. And tongues may have been an earthly language on the day of Pentecost. They may be a heavenly language. But the gift of tongues is not a sign of spiritual maturity. It means absolutely nothing if it doesn't flow out of a motivation of love. There are some people that get all puffed up with themselves because God uses them in a gift. I've said it many, many times. Gifts don't mean fruit, and you can have gifts and split hell wide open. I don't care how gifted a person is. I want to know how fruitful they are. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and if I have not love, it profits me nothing. I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Paul said, what motivates me in my ministry is Christ's love for me. That's what needs to be motivating us when we're used in spiritual gifts. The love of Christ flowing through us as it flows to us. And because he loves me, I'm going to let his love flow through me to others. And I'm going to let Jesus receive the glory. Though I have the gift of prophecy. And I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity... I am nothing. Spiritual gifts may impress man, but they do not impress God. Let me say that again. Spiritual gifts may impress man, but they do not impress God. We are nothing without the fruit of love. You can have all the gifts, but if you don't have the fruit of love, the the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. Against such there is no law. If you don't have the fruit of love flowing through you, the Bible says speak the truth in love. And if you're not doing it in love, if you're doing it out of a sense of ego and self-promotion and popularity and the praise of man, you need to stop doing it. Amen? And how many know you can stop doing it because the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet? Some people say, I can't help it. It just came out of me. That's not biblical. It didn't just come out of you. You know how they knew they were filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost? The Bible said, for they heard them speak with other tongues. They didn't hear God speak with other tongues. They heard the disciples speak with other tongues. God gave the language, but they had to speak it. That's why a lot of people don't get baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. They're waiting for God to speak for them. But the Bible said they heard them speak with tongues. They didn't hear God speak in tongues. They heard the disciples speak in tongues. And the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. God will give you the language, but you can yield to him and use it, or you can resist him and hold it back. And the same is true with spiritual gifts. 
You can hold prophetic ministry back. You can hold tongues back. Don't tell me that it just came out of you. You need to understand things have got to be done decently and in order. And we'll get into that in chapter 14. But there's an order to spiritual giftings. We need the fruit of love. And if I'm not motivated by love, I need to not utilize the gift. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burned, if I have not charity, it profits me nothing. If I have prophetic ministry, if I have word of knowledge, if I have the gift of faith, I'm nothing if I don't have love. If I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned, if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. Good deeds without love do not get you credit with God. How many know good works don't get you to heaven, period? Amen. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. And so you can do all the good works you want to do, but good works don't get you to heaven. Good works don't get the approval of Almighty God in your life. Then he gets into verses 4 and 4 through 8. He starts to give characteristics of love, and he starts to define what constitutes love. And I believe the reason the Apostle Paul put the 13th chapter right here where he put it is because there was a lot of disorder and there was a lot of ego going on in the Corinthian church. The party spirit had already been demonstrated back in the first couple of chapters. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. And there was no love between them. It was a competition. And so Paul's trying to tell them, don't start bragging and comparing yourselves among yourselves because when you compare yourselves among yourselves, you are not wise. And he says, let me, let me give you a description of what needs to motivate you when you're used in the gifts of the Spirit. He said, charity, number one, suffers long and is kind. What does it mean that charity suffereth long? It means it suffers a long time. It puts up with a whole lot of pain. It, it doesn't mean that it just endures. It endures some difficult times, and it is slow to anger. Real love doesn't get mad in a hurry. If you blow off your steam at somebody instantaneously, you're not being motivated by love. Something else is motivating you if you erupt like a volcano when somebody says something to you that rubs you the wrong way. Charity suffereth long. James 1 and verse 19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Amen? You need to learn how to endure suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is what? Long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many know that we put him through a lot? If you don't, I do. And I know I do. He suffers long with me. Chamberlain, how come you're not a little better off than you are right now? You should be, you know. I've given you opportunities, and you still blow it. You're still messing up and you're still making mistakes and he has to put up with a lot with me. Sometimes my attitude isn't always the best as it should be and, and I know when that happens and it's usually when I'm tired. Hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. Halt, amen? And I know when I get tired, that's when I su I'm susceptible to being a little more grumpy and cranky. Amen? And, and, and that's when the tempter comes is when you're not at your best. How many know what I'm talking about? I, don't all look at me. You need to be looking in the mirror because some of you ought to be shouting, Amen, I'm the same way, Pastor. I'm just getting real with you, and I'm just letting you know I acknowledge my fault, my sin, my transgression is ever before me like David said. 
I know when I, when I get out of balance, and I thank God he's long-suffering within, with me, because if he wasn't long-suffering, what would he do? He'd give up on me. He'd throw me away, but how many know he's still working on me? Tell your neighbor, God's still working on me. Amen. Amen. Thank God he is. When he gets done working on you, you'll be a masterpiece, you'll be perfect, and you'll be in heaven. But until you get to heaven, guess what? You're still a work in progress. And I, I need to understand that if he's long-suffering with me, I need to be long-suffering with other people. If I love them, I can put up with some things. No, I don't need to put up with abuse. I'm not talking about putting up with abuse, but sometimes you may have to put up with some abuse. Sometimes you may have to endure it. And what you do is you handle it with the right attitude. Charity suffereth long. It's slow to anger. It doesn't get mad and blow up like a firecracker or a dynamite stick when the fuse is short. Love is kind. What does it mean to be kind? It means to be gentle. It means to be tender, to be affectionate, to be courteous. One of the points of the Royal Ranger Code is a Royal Ranger is alert, clean, honest, courageous, loyal, and courteous. You know, courtesy's gone out the window in our day and age. You think of Southern hospitality, if you go down south, somebody will call you sir and ma'am, and you come up here to the north country and the frozen chosen, and people aren't quite so kind. Get out of my way, you jerk. Get off the road, pull it over, park it, or drive it, you know? And they'll flip you off at the drop of a hat, and there's, there's, there's an absence of kindness and courtesy going on. How many have forgotten the words please and thank you? There's an expectancy of you demand it, and, and it's a lack of kindness when you start demanding your rights. And this sense of entitlement that our modern generation seems to have, and some of our older people are adopting it themselves, they think everything is, they deserve it all, and when they don't get what they think they deserve, they blow up. They'll blow up at the cashier at the store. They'll blow up at the teller at the bank. They'll blow up at uh, the teacher in the school. They'll just blow up, and the kindness has gone out of, the, out of the society. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 and verse 32, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. In, in Genesis chapter 50, and verse 21, the Bible said, Genesis 50, 21. Do we have that up there? It's where Joseph showed kindness to his brethren. Amen? Let me turn there real quick. Genesis chapter 50 and verse number 21. There it is. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. He didn't attack them. He didn't charge them and, uh, and admonish them. He was kind in his words. And we heard Sunday on Mother's Day for the woman of Proverbs 31, on her tongue, uh, her mouth is filled with the tongue of kindness. Amen. And so we need kindness because love is kind. Boaz was kind to Ruth when she was gleaning in his field. He said to his workers, make sure you leave some for her to glean. Deliberately drop some along the way so she has some to get. He showed kindness to, to Ruth as she was gleaning in his field. If we were more like Boaz today, and we would help one another out. The good Samaritan showed kindness to the man who was laying in the ditch. He didn't say, you're an inconvenience. The priest did, the Levite did, but the good Samaritan showed kindness. He took him and bound up his wounds and was tender with the man and spoke healing words to him and gave healing acts to him. And 
He was kind to the man. Love is kind. Love envieth not. It's not jealous. It's not jealous. What is envy? It's jealousy. Envy is the inner emotion that leads to strife, which is the outward contention. James 3 and verse 16 said, where there's envying and strife, there's confusion in every evil work. Envying is the emotion inside of you, and strife is the outward behavior that you demonstrate that flows from the emotion of envy and jealousy. So if you love somebody, you're not jealous of them. You're not competing with them. You're not trying to prove that you're better than they are. Love envieth not. It vaunteth not itself. It doesn't boast. It doesn't brag. Proverbs 27 and verse 2, Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. You don't have to believe your own press, Jack. There are a lot of people who write their own publicity page and read it line for line, word for word, and, and believe everything that's there. You need to let somebody else begin to give you praise and give you uh, accolades, not yourself. You don't vaunt yourself. An insecure person tends to brag. It's not a secure person that boasts of his accomplishments. Paul said, if anyone had the reason to boast, I have more reason than all of you. But I don't boast in what I've done. My boast is in my infirmities, in my afflictions, because when I am weak, then am I strong. I'm not going to come out and brag about all the things that I've done and who I am and how I studied to the feet of Gamaliel. And he, he ended up telling them that at one point because he had to defend something. But he told them, I haven't been bragging about the fact that I was taken up into the third heaven. I don't come down and brag about the experiences I've had. I don't need to do that because I'm not an insecure person. I know what God's done in my life, and I don't have to be vaunting myself and putting my, it's not puffed up. Love is not full of pride. Pride can be evidenced in ways other than boasting, by the way. How many know that pride can be demonstrated through nonverbal actions? The Bible says, because the daughters of Zion walked with outstretched necks, mincing as they go, I will lay bare their secret part. I'll smite them with baldness and instead of well-said hair and... I will smite them with a scab because they walk around arrogant. They just have that air. You ever see somebody that they didn't have to say a word, but they were full of themselves and you just knew it the way they carried themselves? Love isn't puffed up. You know, you like a, my mother used to call me a banny rooster. You know, you stick your chest out and you strut, you know, a strutting bird and, you know, and, that's, that's someone who's puffed up. They puff their chest out. They throw their head back, and they just have an air about them. And the Bible said love isn't puffed up. It doesn't brag on itself. It doesn't vaunt itself. It doesn't exalt itself. How many know that love takes the low road? How many know that love is humble? Love is not arrogant. It envieth not. It vaunteth not itself. It is not puffed up. Love doth not behave itself unseemly. What does that mean? It doesn't behave disgracefully. It shows respect and it doesn't put others down. So many times when we see somebody that is doing what we think we can do better than they can do, we criticize them. We, we, we act in a disgraceful manner. We bring shame to Christ by doing that. It seeks not her own. Love is not selfish. Philippians 2 and verse 4 said, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of what? Of who? Others. In honor 
preferring one another. Romans 15, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope in the glory of God. Must be I gave Cheryl the wrong text there. Because what's that? Oh, it's, yeah, it should be 15. Romans 15. Let me turn there and read it. I never make mistakes, so it couldn't have been me. What, what did I just read? What? Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. You need to be like-minded like Christ was to us. He didn't seek his own, did he? When he went to the cross, was he seeking himself or was he seeking the lost? For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Seeks not her own, seeks those that are lost and those that are on the outside. Love is not easily provoked. In other words, love has a long fuse. Love remains calm doesn't go off like a bomb. Remember Peter, when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden? What did Peter do? He erupted like a volcano and cut the guard's ear off. That's not love. That's not love. He didn't understand the will of God. He didn't stay calm. He reacted. He didn't respond. That's the problem with some of us. We're reactionary, not responsive. And the difference between being reactionary and being responsive is when you're reactionary, it is off the cuff. It's impulsive action. But when you respond, it's calculated. You check things out. You count the cost before you build your tower. And Peter did not act responsively or responsibly, he acted reactionary because his love was easily provoked. It thinketh no evil. Love is not a fault finder. How quick we are to think the worst about people instead of the best about them, especially if it's somebody that's gotten under our skin in the past. And then all of a sudden, we, we think that everything they do is intentional. Don't assume the worst. Let me just say this, don't assume. You know what happens when you assume. I don't have to tell you. But when you assume, generally, you're, n you're not always right. Your assumptions are not factual in every case. And the Bible tells us that love thinks no evil. How many of you look at somebody and you've known their, you say, well, I'm just judging them on their past behavior and their track record. I don't care what their track record is. Maybe they've had a change of heart. I cannot think evil when somebody does something. I'm not going to think that their intentions were other than what they were. It, it rejoiceth not in iniquity. Love does not feel good when others fail or struggle. We tend to feel good about ourselves when somebody else messes up. It makes us justify, I'm not so bad after all. So when we see somebody else take the tumble, we get a little bit happy. Good, I'm not the only one. Hallelujah. That's not love. That's selfishness. You're more concerned about how it makes you feel about you and how you justify your wrong by their wrong, but how many know two wrongs never made one right? So love does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It rejoices when others do well. Can you get happy when someone else is blessed? 
Romans 12 and verse 15 says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. If you love somebody, then you're going to be happy for them when good comes their way, not jealous of them, which we already talked about, love envieth not. You don't need to be jealous of them or thinking the worst of them. They didn't deserve it. They got it, it, they got it wrongfully. They shouldn't have got that blessing. They stole it. You're, you're doing a couple things that are unloving there. You're, you're, you're thinking evil, and you're rejoicing not in the truth. You're rejoicing in iniquity, but you're not rejoicing in the truth. But love rejoices when others succeed. And the Corinthian church, they were all competitive, and they were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and they were talking about all their giftings and all the way that they were used of God, but there was no order to the way they used and operated in their gifts. They were totally out of order, and they were not operating out of love. Love hopeth all things. What does that mean? That means hope wants the best for others. I'm not happy when somebody else gets knocked down. If you are called to be a servant of God, servant is a minister. A minister is a servant. And if you're called to serve God and you're called to minister for him, then you've got to want the best for everybody around you. Can I tell you that in the ministry that everybody that comes to my office or that I come in contact with is perfect or problem-free and not problematic? Can I say some of them? Not all. Can I say that everybody that comes in is innocent? and not guilty of causing trouble, that I've never run into a troublemaker in all my years of ministry. No, I can't say that. I've run into plenty of troublemakers, but I still want God's best for them. I'm not after the punishment. I want the forgiveness. I want God to change their life. I want God to put them on the right path. See, a lot of us are more interested in them being punished than forgiven. But love hopes all things. It wants the best for everybody around. It rejoiceth in the truth. It beareth all things. What does that mean? The word bear in the original Greek actually means it covers all, all things. And it says in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12, hatred stirreth up strife, but love does what? Covers what? What? All. All sin. We read in the New Testament, love covers a multitude of sin, but Proverbs said love covers... How many know that when Jesus died, there's not certain sins that his love doesn't cover? I don't care how sinful you are. I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care what you've done. How do you get worse than adultery and murder? But God forgave and God restored David. Amen? God used David. He didn't just forgive him. He used him and gave him a position because love bears all things. It puts up when, with people that don't treat you right. It covers it. It doesn't ignore it. It chooses to cover it. Anybody ever been hurt by somebody and they did it deliberately? It's easy to want to get even, isn't it? I hope they get what they've got coming to them. But the Bible said God turned the captivity of Job when he did what? When he prayed for his friends. And he didn't pray for God to judge him or God to damn him to hell. He prayed for God to work in him. Let me tell you something. We need to bear all things. It believes all things. That doesn't mean it accepts all things. Love doesn't accept everything blindly. You prove all things. You try the spirits. When it says it believes all things, it means it puts it in the most positive light that it can be put into. 
not everything is going to be as we'd like it to be, but you can still see it in the best light possible. Think positively about people. Think positively about situations. Philippians 4 and verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be virtue and praise, think on these things. Love believes all things, it beareth all things, it hopeth all things, and love endures all things. It bears up through the ups and downs of life. It holds tight, no matter if things are easy or if things are difficult. It endures, it holds to the end. And then in verse 8, he goes on and he says this, he said, charity never fails. What does that mean? That means love is eternal. Love doesn't die when man dies. How many know that we're still going to love when we go to heaven? You're going to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You'll love your neighbor as yourself. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are what? Can you see love? No, you can see a manifestation of love, but love is unseen. Love is, is the emotion and that motivates you to act on it. Love may be demonstrated outwardly, but love flows from the internal because it's eternal. And what is not seen is eternal and what is seen is temporal and so love is always going to be love will never fail whether they be prophecies they shall fail whether they be tongues they shall fail whether it be knowledge it shall stop it'll cease amen prophecies will fail tongues will cease and knowledge will vanish away how many understand spiritual gifts are temporary? I'll say it again. Spiritual gifts are temporary. But I want to say this too, and I'm going to preach it on Sunday. They didn't die out with the apostles. They're still operating right now, but one day they will come to an end. People that want to tell you that speaking in tongues died out with the apostles and they use this verse as their proof text that tongues will cease and they say there it is in writing black and white they'll say when that which is perfect is come then that which is in part shall be done away tongues will cease and that which is perfect is the word of God and my response is it is the word of God but not the written word it's the living word it's Jesus and he hasn't come yet when he comes again then tongues will cease but if tongues were to cease right now, we'd all be stupid. Because in the very verse it says tongues will cease, it says knowledge will vanish away. There's no more knowledge when there's no more tongues. Because when Jesus comes and takes us home, we will know also as we are already known. We'll know the way Christ knows. We'll have a heavenly knowledge, not just an earthly knowledge. But until Jesus comes, the gifts are still flowing, but when Jesus comes again, we won't have a need for those gifts. So they're temporary, and although the gifts will cease when Christ returns, love will not cease when Christ returns. Charity never fails, but whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they will cease. Whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, As it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Acts 1 and verse 7, it says, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Amen? He, they said, will, will, he, will, you, will God restore the kingdom at this time? 
And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons, but he went on in verse 8, but you'll receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You don't know everything God knows. How many know that Jesus doesn't even know when he's coming? Only the Father knows. So if Jesus doesn't even know when he's coming, how do you think you know everything? We know in part. Our knowledge is limited. Why? Because we're human. We're not divine. He's omniscient. He knows all things. We're not omniscient. I can't read your mind. I don't know what you want from me. You don't know what I expect from you all the time. We don't have a clear understanding. We know in part. Deuteronomy 29 and 29 says that the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. There are some things that we don't understand that only God understands. The secret things belong to God. That's a great verse when you don't have the answer somebody's asked, uh, asking of you. Just tell them this. The secret things belong to God. I don't know it all, but he knows what I don't. Hallelujah. We know in part and we prophesy in part. In other words, our prophetic utterance, since prophecy is temporary and it's limited, then what we prophesy and how we prophesy is limited. And a lot of times it's limited to what God allows us to have. It is, it's only partial. But when that which is perfect has come, we dealt with that a moment ago, that which is perfect is not the written word of God. It's the living word of God. The Bible said that he's without sin, that he's spotless, that he's perfect. Amen? And how many know that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God? The same was in the beginning with God. And by him are all things created and made. Amen? Without him, nothing is created that is created. He is the perfect one, and so when he comes again, then that which is in part shall be done away. But until the return of Christ, we are only getting a partial understanding. How many know that when you start to read a lot of the uh, uh, apocryphal books like Daniel and Ezekiel and Revelation, that a lot of that is speculation because it's typology. And a lot of what goes on in these books are only man's interpretation, not necessarily truth. I don't preach often from the book of Revelation except from the scriptures that I know, that I know, that I know what it's saying. I'll deal with the seven churches. I'll deal with the vials that are coming. That God said he'll pour these out. But I'm not going to tell you that the armies of the north are Russia and China. They may well be, but that's not known. That's an assumption. So I can't preach those things if I don't know them. And a lot of people get into the book of Revelation and they start speaking truth for what is only typology and symbolism. And so I want you to understand that we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, when Jesus comes again, then we'll understand what was being said in the Scripture that we may not understand now. Does that make sense to everybody here? It's quiet. Do you understand what I'm saying, or do you need me to give more clarification? God's Word is true, but we don't always have a clear understanding because we're limited. We prophesy in part. We know in part. But when that which is perfect is come, when Jesus comes, then that which is in part shall be done away. Amen? Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will never pass away because God's word is revealed in truth, but our understanding of it is not always complete. That's what I'm trying to get across. God's word is always perfect, but our understanding of it isn't always perfect. But when Jesus comes, is what it's saying, when that which is perfect, when he comes again, then we will understand what he was saying and we'll know what it actually meant in its interpretation. When I was a child, I spake 
as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. A boy becomes a man when? I was talking to somebody yesterday in my office giving some counsel. A boy becomes a man when he takes on the responsibility of a man. It's not a chronological age. A boy doesn't become a man at the age of 13 like the bar mitzvah says he does with the Jewish faith. There are grown boys that are not men. They've never, re, they've never taken the responsibility that is theirs. I heard of somebody the other day that's back $40,000 on his child support. That's not being a man. There are men, think they're men. They're not men. They're boys. All they want to do is play with their toys. There comes a time where you got to work. If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. And you can't be playing with your toys all the time. Although I get on that bike every chance I can. I still have a little boy in me, but hopefully I take the responsibility of being a man. When I was a child, I behaved like a child. What does a child behave like? My way. I want what I want. I want to do it my way. But a man comes in and takes care of his family, takes care of the things that he needs to take care of. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I became a, uh, understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. How many know that? What Paul's saying here is we are called to grow into spiritual maturity. And what he's saying to the Corinthian church is, you have all these giftings, but you're not grown up in God yet. You act like children. You act like infants. You fight, you argue, you complain, you brag, you want to talk about how gifted you are, but you're not fruitful. Your lives don't measure up, and when you're a child, that's the way you act, that's the way you behave, but when you grow up in God, you start behaving differently than you do when you're an infant in Him. Then you can handle the gifts of the Spirit. And I want to tell you, there's responsibility that comes with the gifts. I, I've told this before, but when I was about 18 years old in my dad's church and revival broke out a year or two before that, and it was going on in the church, and I was praying for Phil Baker in the back of the church. Phil was about my age, maybe a year older than me. And as I prayed for him, he got slain out under the power of the Holy Ghost. And in about five minutes, he sat up, and I leaned over, and I touched his head, and he fell back down. Another few minutes, he sat back up, and I reached over and touched his head, and he fell back down. And I did this about three or four times. And the next time he sat up, and I went to touch him, he said, Stop it! I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm having a vision of Calvary and I'm starting to feel the nails and I can't take the pain, so stop it. I was just playing a game. I was learning. But what I was learning was this. There is responsibility with spiritual gifts. You've got to handle them in spiritual maturity. You don't use the gift for your glory and your gain. You use the gift to edify the body. We'll get into that next time in chapter 14, but what motivates you to operate in the gifts of the Spirit? When I was a child, when I was immature, then I behaved in an immature fashion, but when I became mature, I put away childish things. For now I see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. On earth, we're limited in our sight or our view. But when Christ returns, we shall know as he knows. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 49 through 53. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, 
and we will be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. When we receive our heavenly bodies at the rapture of the church, that's when you receive your heavenly body. You're going to have a body just like Jesus. We were created in his image and after his likeness, but when we ascend into heaven, then we're going to be like him. Then we're going to know as we are also known. And it says in verse 13, and we close with this, Now abideth faith, hope, and charity, but the greatest of these is charity. Love is the greatest of all the qualities you can have. doesn't matter how many gifts you have or how often you're used in the gifts. God's not impressed. He's impressed by what motivates you to operate in them. Matthew 22, 37 to 40, Jesus said unto him, they said, what's the greatest commandment? He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In 1 John 4, 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. For he that loveth, know, he that loveth not knoweth not God. For what? God is love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, no matter if I have tongues interpretation, no matter if I have the gift of prophecy and the gift of faith, if I have the gift of word of knowledge and I can read your mail, if I don't reflect the love of Christ, I'm just a bunch of hot air. It doesn't mean a thing. It's the motivation behind the gifting that God's looking at. And only God can read my heart. And he knows why I step out and let him use me in the gifts. And if I'm doing it for selfish motivation or ego, then he's going to deal with me. And I guarantee it may not be right then. He may let me get away with it for some time, but one day I'm going to answer to him for the way I treat the gifts he's given because gifts come with responsibility. They're not games that we play. They're not toys that we use. They are instruments and they are weapons. And we need to take and use them properly and the way to use them properly is to make sure that when God uses you, it's out of a motivation of love for him and love for others. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you for gifts of the Spirit that you give to your children and you use us in those gifts. But I pray that our hearts would always be tuned into you and, Lord, that love would be the motivating factor every time we are used in those gifts. God, I pray that we would not do it for selfish motivation because you told us if we come after you, we deny ourselves and we follow you. So God, tonight I pray, Lord, that there would be a desire for spiritual gifts, that we would covet earnestly the best gifts, but yet you would show us a more excellent way that when you use us in the gifts, we flow in love. So Lord, tonight, check our hearts, examine our lives and check our motives. And Lord, I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. amen, amen. God bless you tonight. Don't forget, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, men's Bible study in the fellowship hall. Amen.